Partnerships Committee, I'd like to welcome obviously members this evening, officers and mem members of the public. If I could just do the webcast notice first. This meeting will be webcast and recorded and retained on the Council's website for up to two years. By participating in this meeting, you are consenting for your name, the content of what you say, and your image to be broadcast and stored to the Council website. If any member, officer or member of the public addressing the committee has concerns with this, please contact the committee services officer immediately. For those at home viewing the webcast, I would like to inform you that if you look above your video, you will see a resources tab. Select this and a link to the agenda will appear in the right hand side. This will allow you to open the agenda in PDF form and follow discussion and debate. Can I please remind those in attendance that they need to turn the microphone on when speaking? Otherwise, what they say will not be captured on the webcast. Please can I also ask that members turn their microphones off when not speaking to avoid microphone feedback. I'd like to firstly welcome Dr. Uh, Rob Barnes uh, to the meeting this, e this evening and thank him for his attendance. And also just to, I'd like to thank um, Councillor Camfer for helping to support um, inviting Dr. Barnes along this evening. If we could now go please to agenda item two um, for apologies for absence. I know we have obviously uh, Councillor Camfer um, Apologies, and Councillor Mary Jordan is obviously deputising, thank you. Um, and I also have apologies from Councillor uh, Paul Martin. Is there any other apologies, please? No, Chair, there's no other apologies. Okay, thank you. If we could go to agenda item three, please. Uh, do we have any member declarations of interest, please? Thank you. Uh, Councillor Walsh, please. Yeah, just on agenda item, the integrated care service. I've got two daughters who work for the NHS. Uh, Councillor Cossier. Yeah, thanks. Um, my wife works for the NHS and I'm a director of a construction company that takes part in contracts with the NHS. Councillor Jordan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I work for the NHS. My son's a GP in the NHS and I'm a trustee of Inky Babies. Thank you. Is there any other declarations of interest? No? Thank you. If we could now go to item, agenda item four, please, the minutes of the last meeting. Um, I'm happy to obviously approve these. Do I have a seconder, please, committee? Uh, Councillor Berry, thank you. If we could now go to agenda item number five, do we have any public questions or statements or petitions, please? None, Chair. Thank you. And if we could now move to agenda item six, pages nine to 14 on your agenda. Um, I would like to hand over to uh, Dan Sharples, please, who will just give us a bit of an overview of this item, please. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so at the council meeting on the 6th of September, members may recall the question was put to the chair of the partnerships committee relating to access to GP services. In response, the chair undertook to refer the matter to the partnerships committee in order for the committee to be able to scrutinize it. Therefore, this report has been produced to enable the committee to discuss the matter further. Although a representative of the CCG isn't able to attend, colleagues from the CCG have provided data on access to GP services, which are detailed in the report before you from sections 3.5 to 3.9. This details the total number of attendants for GP services and the method used in both 2020 and 2021. Following a query from the group spokespersons, further information has been included on data for 2019 at section 3.9. We've also got Dr. Rob Barnett, a GP in Liverpool, uh, who's been invited to contribute to the meeting that's here today. So members are invited to note the report, which provides them the opportunity to discuss the matter in further detail. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Could I just hand over now to uh, Dr. Rob Barnett, please, just to give an overview of general practice and also around obviously e-consults, please. Thank you, Dr. Barnett. Excellent, at least I know how to use the microphone service. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, my name is Rob Barnett, I'm a GP in Liverpool um, and I've actually been a GP for 34 years. The subject um, that you want to talk about, access, has been an issue and a bone of contention for as long as I've been a GP, in as much as there are always people who are complaining and have complained that it's difficult to get to see a GP when they've wanted to. And despite the various uh, efforts and plans that people have had in place, we've never ever had a system 
in which the, su the supply of appointments has met the demand of patients. And that's the case that, that we're certainly seeing now. If I go back to um, just before the pandemic, so 2018-19, uh, the government at that point was trying to persuade GPs to look at ways of providing services slightly differently, to look at online consultations, and also to encourage GPs to use more forms of remote consultations. Whether they knew there was a pandemic or not, I don't know. Uh, but the fact is that uh, by the time we got to March uh, 2020, when uh, the pandemic struck us, it was very clear that we had to work in a different way. And almost overnight, we were expected to greatly curtail uh, the number of face-to-face -face appointments, uh, but to try and work uh, remotely. And it was a steep learning curve for, uh, for GPs and for their teams. And, and I think that um, despite everything that was thrown at us, we did a, a reasonable job. But clearly, there were issues in terms of uh, our patients, uh, how they accessed us, and not everyone had access to, um, to computers or to tablets. Not everyone has got access to a telephone. And so there were problems in terms of um, how we met, we met the needs of our patients. If we wind the, the clock forward a little bit, um, as we uh, got used to the IT equipment, but also as um, the way in which we worked was uh, being sort of more uh, mandated or dictated by NHS England, we had to modify what we were doing to not only meet the demands of our patients, but also to ensure that we provided uh, safe services for our patients, for our staff, but also for ourselves. And that clearly has been an issue and, and continues to be an issue now. And we are still working under um, guidance, uh, infection prevention control guidance, which says that despite everything in the NHS, uh, sorry, in the wider population opening up in the NHS, we still have to um, adhere to social distancing. We're expected to, to wear masks. We're expected to wear PPE. We're expected to keep patients uh, apart from each other. So we can't go back to a system uh, that we had uh, pre-pandemic where everyone had their doors open and where waiting rooms were full of patients. And there's a good reason for that. And that is, we don't always know that, you know, what's wrong with our patients. And we have to keep patients who potentially could have COVID away from those uh, who are immunocompromised, those who are severely ill, uh, those who are elderly and could be susceptible to infection. And that's the system that we're working in now. You've got uh, within your papers um, quite a bit of information about the number of consultations that um, are taking place on the Wirral, but now it's a mixture of telephone consultations, um, e-consultations, uh, as well as face-to-face -face consultations. And I can tell you that the proportions uh, of those consultations um, on the Wirral mirror those that are happening elsewhere on Cheshire and Merseyside. And we've got, uh, or I've got access to tables and graphs that show um, the, the proportion of consultations that are taking place across the whole of the Cheshire and Merseyside area. And in fact, all the, all the CCG areas, they mirror each other in terms of the overall availability of consultations. The other thing that they show is the proportion of telephone consultations and e-consultations to face-to-face -face consultations. And I was quite amazed to see that that's mirrored across the, the Cheshire and Merseyside area as well. So no one um, particular CCG area, local council area, um, 
seems to be out of step with others. What we have seen is the overall number of contacts that patients are having with general practice has gone up. And it, that does vary from area to area, but it's somewhere between 10 and 30% more compared to the same time two years ago. So this greater accessibility has certainly uh, shown that, um, that, that GPs and their teams are doing more. One thing that was in its infancy prior to the pandemic um, were e-consultations. Now I have to be quite honest, they're not my favorite way of, um, of consulting or, or managing situations, uh, but clearly there are quite a number of people who, who do like them. Now I, don't, I haven't got the figures uh, for Wirral in relation to e-consultations, but I know in my own area in Liverpool, the, the, the numbers per month have gone up from a, from a mere trickle to now something like 25 to 30,000 e-consultations that GPs are having to do each month. And that's in addition to everything else. One of the problems that we've got with the current way of working is that in some cases, um, patients are sort of being seen two or three times rather than just being dealt with once in, in one visit. So a patient may access a GP for an e-consultation, that gets followed up by a telephone consultation, and then the patient gets called in for a for a face to face. So we're probably not working as efficiently as we could, but we're still on that sort of learning curve. Overall, I think it's about uh, between 47 and 50 percent of consultations now that are taking place face to face. I don't know what the right figure should be. Um, but as time is going by, I suspect there are more and more people who are, we, we are seeing face to face. And again, I have to be quite honest with you. Um, I think that we get a lot more out of seeing people face to face than dealing with uh, patients on the telephone because we miss cues that we would get if we actually had someone sitting in, in our waiting room. But there is absolutely no way we could get through the overall workload if we were working as we were working pre-pandemic. And part of the problem we've got is that as the overall NHS is becoming choked up with, with demand, then we are dealing with a lot of the, um, the backlog of patients who aren't actually working their way through the secondary care system. So that is in addition to, to everything else that's actually making things uh, more complex for us. So I've given you sort of a, an overview as I see it at the moment. Um, I hope that is of some help to you, but I'm certainly very happy to answer any questions or enter into discussion with any of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Barnes. Uh, do we have any questions at all for Dr. Barnes? Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Is that better? <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, that proved my hearing aids were working anyway. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, thank you for your introduction, Dr. Barnett. Uh, you did say in your presentation that you, you realised that the way face-to-face -face meetings worked, it's far more beneficial not only for yourself but the patients as well. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's getting away. Um, not only more beneficial for yourself but also for the patients seeing them face-to-face. You know, as a GP in Liverpool for over 40 years, obviously you've seen the changes that have taken place. It was my, one of my, ward, uh, one of my uh, party colleagues who put the notice of motion to council in relation to this because we were seeing a lot more people complaining to us about not being able to get uh, a doctor's appointment. And you did say that the average it takes two, day, two to three days to see someone, 
even when you've got an appointment. Uh, the question that comes about from that is, with the changes that have taken place and you're now working 12 hours, or the surgery is open 12 hours, seven days a week, are there enough GPs to fill those low slots? If there isn't, those time scales are gonna get larger and larger between being able to see somebody face to face. And in that time scale, critical things can happen. You know, simple things, you know, chicken pox, all sorts of different things. When you see it initially, you'll know straight away. But if you see just pimples, it could be a, a multitude of things, just as an example. So given that the percentage of the population of Will is very elderly, and there are quite a lot of uh, centenarians on the Will, I'm sure, you know, my next door neighbor is coming up to 102. She wouldn't know what a, she, she know what a computer looks like, <laughs> but we have, to, we have to hold it for her. Uh, thankfully, she's got three good sons who look after her very well, as long as my, as my, my wife. I want to know, the question is, are we gonna have enough GPs going forward to fill all the slots that are available 12 hours a day, seven days a week, moving forward? And on my own GP surgery, uh, quite a few of the doctors are starting to get to the age where they're looking for retirement. And I wouldn't be surprised if that was the same throughout the rest of the world. I wonder if you could answer those questions for me. Thank you. Are you happy for me to? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, thank you very much. You, you, you've asked a number of very interesting um, questions within that. If I can start off by telling you that um, one of my roles in Liverpool is Secretary of the Local Medical Committee and I sort of do my best to look after the interests of uh, GPs in the area. When I, fairly soon after I started as LMC Secretary, a retirement age was brought in for GPs uh, working as principals, working as partners in the practice. And one of my roles was to go round um, encouraging people uh, who were in their 70s, or in fact telling them that they had to retire from the, the role that they enjoyed. Now, I'm trying to encourage people in their 50s, mid 50s, to stay in general practice. So in the space of about 25 years, we have seen a complete sea change um, in, in general practice and how GPs view um, the service they're working in. You asked, are there enough GPs? Back in 2015, the government at the time then reckoned that we were short of 5,000 GPs and they pledged to have 5,000 more GPs working by 2020. By the time we got to 2020, they needed 6,500 GPs to be able to reach the target that they had set. So we haven't got enough GPs, um, and we're struggling to keep the GPs that we've got working in the service um, actually seeing patients. And the sad thing is, a lot are either retiring early because they can't cope with the demands that are on them, and the younger GPs are going elsewhere um, in the world to places like New Zealand uh, because they believe they're going to get a better quality of life there. One of the things that um, the government has been you know, trying to do has been encouraging GPs working uh, to, together in primary care networks to employ people other than GPs to see patients. So we, are, we have seen a growth in the number of pharmacists working in practices. Um, we may well see um, paramedics coming into practices, uh, sort of first contact physiotherapists. And what the healthcare system wants is for people to, uh, if they've got a problem, to not always want to see their GP as their first port of call. 
The difficulty is there's a mis mismatch, I think, between what the government is wanting and what patients want. Because invariably, patients want to see a GP. They want to see someone, it's almost like a, a one-stop shop. They want to see someone who can sort them out and deal with their problems, <laughs> rather than go through a plethora of people and then only if things are really serious, seeing their GP. But the fact is, we just ha we're not turning out enough people as doctors, and we're not turning out enough of those doctors as, as GPs. So I think the problem is going to get worse before it gets better. And then just finally, in relation to the way we're working, we are still being expected to operate what's called a total triage system, whereby we ask patients what, what's wrong with them before they come in to see us. And that's the other reason why there might be a bit of a delay in patients getting to see us. However, it does mean that we as clinicians are able to try and sort of ensure that those people who need to be seen today can be seen today. And again, it's a, there's a difference, I think, between what, what people want and what they need. And we, I'll be honest, we can't supply what people want. We are doing our best to supply what people need. Thank you. Is there any other question? Oh, uh, Councillor Johnson and Councillor Berry, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Barnett, for your report and discussion there. Um, anecdotally, people are definitely um, saying what you're saying, that the primary care is letting them down. They'd rather be seeing their GPs face-to-face. E-consult and telephone consulting is just nothing um, like what they're used to or indeed what they need from their GP surgeries. So I appreciate what you're saying, but there are urgent cases that I know of and could quote to you um, of people who've had to go straight to... The hospitals. So the hospitals, I would say, are taking the brunt of the fact that the GP services currently are not really meeting many of the needs of the local residents. So I think that's an issue that certainly we're hearing at hospital level as well. And I guess part of this is relation to is relating to the tri triage system, the triage system that you operate, um, and that's often not run by clinicians. And the decisions being made are therefore made and being made in a non-clinical way. So I'd, I'd like, I'd appreciate your comments on the, that, that system, please, and if that could maybe be more clinical in nature to give um, people the assurance, I guess, that it, this is, it, it is it's properly um, being taken from a medical perspective. And I guess another point I'd make is that certain sectors, such as social care, um, are working very well face-to-face -face with our most vulnerable people in society, and they've worked right the way through. And yes, they've operated with very strong protective mechanisms in place and testing, etc. So I can appreciate the fact that you don't want a waiting room full of people potentially cross-infecting, but there are ways that can be done. You can text people from cars. You can, you can have a more modern system of a waiting room sitting in, in a car park, for instance, waiting for, for you or, or outside at the very least. Um, so I, I just think perhaps there needs to be more thought put into what after the waiting room, what can be done um, after that. So I'd appreciate your comments on that. Thank you. Thank you. In relation to the, the triage system, I accept that different practices do things in different ways. I can tell you the way my own practice works, and that is that a patient will ring up um, and the receptionists just literally take down the basic details and every call, uh, every patient who contacts the practice gets, gets a phone call from a GP and it's the GP, it's the clinician who then determines whether it's a face-to-face -face consultation that's needed or whether it's something that can be dealt with over the telephone. If a patient uh, does contact us um, via email, via e-consult, then yes, an administrative member of staff will, will filter that through to determine whether that's something that requires a doctor to act or whether it's an administrative task that needs to, to take place from that. The, the bit about the service letting people down I think is very difficult because I passionately believe that if someone is seriously ill and they need to be seen, they should be being seen 
by a, by a primary care clinician, by a GP, and there should be facilities to see people that day. And certainly that's the way um, my, my own practice works. But I, I'd also accept the fact that there are practices that are short of staff, they are short of doctors, um, they may be short of nurses, and that they are, that they are firefighting, they are doing their best under really quite difficult circumstances. In relation to your final point, we, will, we have been working up until very recently under very strict um, command and control um, instructions that were sent down to us from NHS England. Now I've always believed and argued that it's up for G to GPs to determine how they should run their practices and how they should see their patients. But we had, up until literally a couple of months ago, chapter and verse on what was expected of us. Now, that has been relaxed, but the infection pre uh, pre prevention control um, guidelines are still in place. Now, we've heard only in the last couple of days that those are being relaxed within the hospital sector. So I suspect they are going to be relaxed within the primary care sector. And when that happens, then clearly GPs will look at what's being advised and modify uh, the way they work accordingly. But we, but we still will need to make sure, however we do things, that um, patients are in one way segregated or uh, so segregated um, so that we maintain a distance between those who are potentially infectious against those who are potentially vulnerable because the fact is that not enough of the population are being vaccinated and I know that in again in my own area some of the most deprived wards have got the lowest vaccination rates. And, and that is a concern, and we've got to do what we can to protect our patients, all of them. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barry. Thank you. <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> thank you, Dr. Barnett. Um, my question is also to do with the, uh, the triage system. And um, what, what concerns me is that um, and I realise that doctors, GPs are working extremely hard on a very difficult situation and um, you're trying to do the best that, that you can under difficult um, uh, situations, difficult circumstances. Um, but what is happening now in some practices, and this is happening in, in the practice that I belong to, um, when you ring to make an appointment, um, you're being triaged by um, receptionists who are asking, what is wrong with you? Why do you want to see the doctor? And surely that can't be right. I understand that they need to prioritise who sees the doctor or whether you have an e-consultation, uh, whether it's a phone call, and I, I understand that, but surely... Um, receptionists should not be charging um, patients in so much as asking them what is actually wrong with you. It's really difficult. So my own receptionists, even though all the calls come through to the GP, do ask the patients what is wrong. And some patients say, it's nothing to do with you, I want to speak to the doctor. Others say, you know, give, you know, it's, I've got a sore arm or whatever. It's useful for us to be able to know what's wrong, to be able to make sure that, one, we deal with people in an appropriate order, but also it's, it is useful to have, for us to have a vague idea as to the sort of the area that we're going to be dealing with with a particular patient 
rather than just picking up the phone without having a clue. So I can understand that some people might think um, it's an intrusive question. It's not meant to be intrusive. It's meant to, to help us. And I look upon my reception staff. I've always looked upon my reception staff as being my eyes and ears uh, for those who are waiting to see me. So, for example, if I go back to pre-COVID times, when patients walked in or made an appointment uh, to, to see the doctor, it would not be unusual for receptionists to say, this person has come in and I think they need to be seen now, as opposed to waiting for you know, an hour to be seen. Um, and that was really helpful. Or they would say, a sick child has come in. I don't think this child should be waiting. Can you um, bring that child forward to, uh, to be seen earlier? So I don't look upon that now as being any different with the, with the triage system, except for the fact it's, this is now being conducted over the telephone as opposed to face-to-face. To -face. At the end of the day, our receptionists are trained people. They're trained to do the job that they're doing. Um, and they, they shouldn't be looked upon as, um, as being a barrier to the patient being seen, but they should be looked on as being someone who's there to actually help that patient to be seen appropriately. So I don't know if that answers the, the question, but I think that's, that's the way we do need to, to look at things. Just, you know, you, you, you touched on the fact that, that GPs are very busy the we are getting through a lot more patients with the current system than we did have pre-covid i'm not saying it's it's ideal but pre-covid i think that we were expecting the average gp to see between you know 12 and 15 patients in a in a session and uh, in, in a three-hour session I would say now, um, in my own practice, we're probably dealing with about 25. And if we weren't, then I think the waiting list to actually contact a GP would be horrendous. Could I just come back in, please, Chair? Thank you. Um, I fully understand what you're saying, and I appreciate if, if somebody comes in with a sick child, that the receptionist is quite rightly prioritising that situation of someone who's seriously ill. But I think that if somebody does ring to make an appointment and they are asked, what is wrong with you? What's the problem? I think that they should at least say, but if you don't wish to tell me, that's perfectly okay. Because it does put people under pressure. If somebody is really ill and they need to see a doctor, but they feel uncomfortable disclosing what the issue is I think this, it should be worded in, in, in a certain way thank you if I, if, Chair, if I can just come back I completely agree with you and it is not unusual for um, the reception to, to say that you know it's a personal issue nothing was, nothing was said and we don't think any worse of patients you know f for that I think you know, at the end of the day, we're there to try and help patients. And clearly, if, you know, patients feel that they, they don't want to tell a receptionist, then I think that that should be, you know, within their rights. So I haven't got any issue with that. Uh, Councillor Jordan. Oh, thank you, Chair. Given the uh, increased complexity that patients uh, present with lately, uh, I'm certainly in increased more over the last few years. Is 10 minutes long enough for a consultation? Um, absolutely not. So um, in my own practice, uh, we'd already moved to 15 minute consultations. And if you look, you know, what's happening elsewhere in the world, I think in Scandinavia, um, Average consultation is between 35 and 40 minutes. Uh, the fact is, however, it would, it would be impossible for us 
under the current system to 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 manage the workload to to, to handle the patients we've got if um, we were operating in what I would argue would be a the most appropriate and safe way of dealing with things. Um, I find it very, very difficult um, keeping to time and keeping to appointments. I have to show you, I stopped wearing a watch in 1997 because I found it stressful, um, knowing that I wasn't sticking to, to time. Uh, but I then get to, I'm continually told off that I end up having patients waiting longer, you know, than they should to to see me. So it it is really difficult. I think the only way f forward is to try and encourage people to access other members of the primary care team. So for things that don't necessarily need to see a GP, so that GPs can actually uh, spend more time with the more complex patients uh, that we are seeing, and you're quite right, that the patients that we are having to manage in the community uh, are becoming increasingly complex. Thank you. Yeah, would you mind if I just ask some questions, um, Dr. Barnes? Um, obviously, thank you very much for the report and all the information you've given. Um, the, you know, the information we got given, the, um, does that include vaccines with the face-to-face, -face, or is that not, does that not include vaccines? So the, that does not include the, the, the vaccination, the COVID vaccination system, uh, certainly in my area, is over and above uh, that. So, and that's also an additional sort of um, workload upon some GPs. And whilst a lot of vaccinations uh, for COVID can be administered by non-medical people, you're still needing uh, senior clinicians, senior doctors, um, at vaccination sites to deal with queries and, of course, any issues that, that might arise. So, yes, so that's in addition to all of this. If I may just ask a few more questions, please. Um, obviously, there are obviously pre-COVID and obviously post-COVID is two different worlds slightly, but clearly from what you said, obviously there was some... What do you feel are the priorities, obviously, that um, from GPs, practices? I appreciate that different practices may do different things, as I know I've heard some places don't use e-consult, others do, so it can be a different picture. However, as you said, some of the information seems to be the same across the CCGs. And how do GPs actually collectively or feed in to any changes or any sort of, you know, the things that you said is not dissimilar, like seeing the patients. Um, so how does that get fed in or how, how can that improve or what suggestions do you have, please? Uh, Chair, as you're probably aware, um, GP practices have been grouped together into primary care networks. And the, the theory behind the networks is that these groups of GPs um, w will work together cooperatively as opposed to practices working in isolation. So that practices can, I suppose, can learn from one another and can support each other in developing ways of seeing their population of of patients. There is no doubt that different um, demographics of population prefer different methods. So I can
can tell you that the, the age group that is predominantly using e-consultations are the, the 29, sorry, the 20 to 29 year age group. So in my area, over a third of e-consultations are with just that, that particular age group. Also interestingly, um, I think it's about 7% uh, of e-consultations e arrive at GP practices outside of normal hours. And it surprised, well, maybe it shouldn't surprise me, you know, that I've had dealt with e-consultations have uh, been written at two in the morning. Uh, so patients are, are using e-consultations as, um, as a different way of accessing services, just like they'll go to the local supermarket at two in the morning, they'll try and access their GP. And, and it horrified me the other day to get an e-consultation from someone who was in Spain. And I only know they were in Spain because I tried ringing them and uh, they were on the beach. Uh, I have to say I wasn't particularly impressed and I felt that was uh, almost an abuse of the way the service was operating, but that's what we've got. Um, so yes, so we're working with each other, we're learning different ways of trying to, to manage the, the situation, but we're also employing, because, as, because we're being encouraged to, um, other members to be part of our primary care team to help us manage the situation. So whether, and I touched that on before, uh, we've got pharmacists who are helping us with some of the um, complexities uh, to do with uh, managing patients who are on lots of different medications. So that might help to ease some of the workload. Employing more uh, nurses um, to help us with some of the long-term condition management uh, that we've got. Um, employing paramedics to deal with some of, the, some of the type of cases that might come to a practice that um, you know, could be dealt with by a paramedic as opposed to seeing a GC. So between us, we're learning different ways you know, of trying to manage the situation. It doesn't get us away from the fact though that patients still want to see a GP and the fact is that the overall um, demand on our service is far greater than what I think we can meet safely. Do I just come back? Do you think that obviously because of, I mean, clearly obviously there's the pandemic, that obviously in some practice we've heard, obviously like in some practice that people then, uh, there's more people turning up at A&E, so it's having a knock-on effect as well at A&E. And, and this is really difficult um, because patients turn up at A&E and invariably say it's because they couldn't get to see their GP. And unless we actually track individual patients through the system, it's difficult to know how they tried to see their GP and what actually happened uh, at, the, at the practice. Personally, I believe everyone who, who needs to see a GP, not necessarily who wants, but everyone who needs to see a GP because of their clinical condition should be able to see their GP. And if, you know, there is, there are instances or there's evidence that practices aren't able to, to meet that uh, particular need, then someone does need to, to look to see, you know, what's happened. Is it because they haven't got enough GPs? Is it because um, people have been off sick? Uh, at the end of the day, GP practices are, are operated by, staffed by human beings. And we have had practices where you know, sometimes 50% of the staff at any one particular time have been off either because they've had, they've had COVID themselves or they've had to self-isolate because of it. So practices have not been immune from um, everything that, you know, the rest of the population have had and that might be part of the problem as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mitchell, oh, and Councillor Johnson, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just... Um going to cross over to a later item on the agenda. But, but thank you, Dr. Barnett, for being honest and open with all your answers to the questions I've been put, first of all. Thank you for that. You mentioned CCGs just. Now, the coming integrated care community, 
all those CCG's groups are going to disappear into one. Will you still have the same ability to address all those issues that you believe you're going to be able to? And I'd just like to say before I finish, uh, given the time scale of things, you know, for people to see a doctor face to face, I just hope we don't have an outbreak of shingles, given I'm in that age group. Thank you. In relation to shingles, um, I, I can't remember how old you are, but if you're between 70 and 79, uh, then you're entitled to have a, a vaccination against shingles, so hopefully that would protect you. Um, coming back to your question on um, inter integrated care systems, my crystal ball doesn't tell me what the system's going to be like uh, come April 2022. Uh, I have some concerns and worries as CCGs disappear, but I think a lot will depend on what happens in each place. And so clearly on the Wirral, there will be a lot to be done to make sure that uh, the demise of CCGs uh, doesn't result in a deterioration in services, um, in primary care services in particular. I think a lot will have to be done to ensure that, um, you know, resources that, you know, are destined for places at the moment, that that doesn't get lost. Um, and it's, I'm afraid, way beyond my pay scale to, to know exactly how all of this is going to work and pan out. Uh, if I can just, you just indulge me for two seconds, you know, I'm worried the fact that we're approaching October, we still do not have a chair of an ICS, we still don't have a chief officer of an ICS, um, which means that by the time they're in post, there'll be less than six months to ensure um, everything is in place. Um, but I'm sure that uh, there are lots of people who are looking into that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Johnson, then Councillor Brennan, and Councillor Cottier, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Bonnet, again. Um, I would say you've talked, obviously, about your own practice and your own experiences, which we would expect, so thank you for that. Uh, and I guess we're hearing on the ground about disparity in Wirral between different practices and GP levels. I don't expect you in any way to understand those differences that do exist. But I think it, we do need to be aware that we, we, we are here to protect and look after our, our residents as much as we can. And I'm particularly concerned about the vulnerable ele element of our population who don't have access to IT, don't do this at e-consultant communications, and are almost being locked out, in a sense, from the GP world. So I think going forwards, we do need to do some work with patient groups, with feedback from patients, and start bu building together some feedback um, so that the, the, the future, if you like, of, of GP practices and the way you operate and work is informed by what patients are also saying. And it's not just obviously the GPs, you'll have your opinions individually and collectively, I'm sure, of course you will. Um, but and NHS England are obviously having a big impact upon the way that you're operating at the moment. But going forwards, as we move forwards, I'd really encourage us, us within Wirral to be considering the patient voice and what we can do to listen to that patient voice very loudly as GP practices are rebuilt and changed. Thank you. Chair, if I could just say, each practice is expected to have a patient participation group, and that should be the patient's voice uh, to the practice on the way the practice is running. In an ideal world, I look upon, and I was sort of brought up with um, there being one whole time equivalent GP per 1,600 patients, and, and I believe that that's ideally what we need. Unfortunately, I think that we haven't got the, the right quantity of GPs to necessar necessarily, you know, provide that service. So in some cases, you know, practices are working in different ways. You know, again, I will be honest with you. Um, I know there are practices where there's sort of one GP per three or 4,000 patients, um, and they operate with a lot of um, advanced nurse practitioners 
and, and other members of the primary care team to sort of filter things out, filter patients out, so that only certain patients get to see a GP. And, and I suspect, unfortunately, that is the way things are going because there just aren't the number of you know, doctors around um, in the service. And all I can say is that, you know, if patients are not happy uh, with the service they've got, um, then almost, and I, and I know I'm going to say something and you'll say it's not possible, but they have to vote with their feet and they have to register with practices that are going to provide the service uh, that they want. And I appreciate that's not as easy, it's not as easy uh, said than done. But you're quite correct that um, a one-size-fits-all doesn't work and we are doing a disservice for our patients if we don't take into account the needs of vulnerable patients. Thank you. Councillor Brown, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. And thank you very much, Dr Barnett, for giving up your Tuesday evening to come uh, speak to us this evening. Mine's not so much a question for you as uh, feedback to officers, although you might want to comment on some of the issues uh, I'm going to raise. Uh, and it's just, it's just on the paper. I think the paper would be significantly strengthened uh, and aid our understanding if it addressed things like what the pre-pandemic situation looked like for GP consultations which it doesn't, the world started, or quite a lot of the data presented, the world started uh, in April 2020. Secondly, uh, if we could have had that data disaggregated by the socio-economic characteristics of the patients being covered, I want to know whether uh, people in social class A uh, get face-to-face -face consultations more often uh, than people in lower social classes, for example. I can't find that uh, from uh, this data. And thirdly, if um, the information we were presented with um, was uh, located in a whole system analysis. So um, Dr Barnett has mentioned, for example, uh, the problems now having to deal with the backlog uh, of uh, secondary care patients and how that's impacting on the primary care system. So, um, but there will be other whole system issues in terms of the impact on A&E, the impact on walking centres and so on, uh, which uh, if uh, the paper had have dealt with those issues, I think would have given us a much more rounded understanding uh, of what's uh, been happening uh, in the system. So obviously we are where we are with this, but just as a sort of general feedback for um, the type of information that I would like to see, I, th I think that hopefully is helpful. Uh, Councillor Cossier, please. Thanks, Chair, and again, I'd like to echo Dave's comments. Thank you very much, Dr. I just keep going back to the triage, um, and deregulation keeps popping into my mind. It's, it's like a, it, it, you're diluting the service. Can I ask a personal question? Do you see it as deregulation, and do you think it's a lowering of standards? Prior to the pandemic, we didn't operate the triage system that we're operating at the moment. And I would say it was forced upon us. Would I go back to the system we had before? Probably not, because um, I don't think that we were necessarily uh, meeting everyone's demands before. I'm not saying we're meeting them now. I think we're, we are meeting things, uh, meeting their demands and their needs and wants in a different way. I don't think we've got the balance right. I think that probably um, we will end up with a situation in which about two thirds of our consultations are face to face. So I think there is no doubt that quite a bit of what we do uh, can be dealt with on the telephone. Um, I think some of what we do could be dealt with more administratively. The, the difficulty um, with triage, though, is 
that potentially it makes things difficult for certain people. So people who don't like using the telephone, how do they get access to us? Um, or people who, who can't use a, a tablet or a computer. And I know that there are some practices who sort of insist that access is initially made via an e-consultation. And I think I don't, I think that's unfair on people. Um, I don't know if any of you have tried to uh, do an e-consultation, but I can tell you I think they're impossible. Um, and, you know, invariably I have to ring a patient anyway after they've completed an e-consultation to try and understand what exactly it is they want, unless it's just another sick note. Um, so I don't think we've got it right. I think we need a mixture of things. Um, but I don't think we can go back to a situation where we just had our doors open all the time and just let the waiting room, you know, fill up. So the, the pendulum hasn't settled where it needs to settle. Not yet. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Councillor Wright? Oh, sorry, I didn't see it. And Councillor Hayes as well, please. Many thanks, Dr. Barnett, for your honesty and talking about your experience, which is very important. And uh, that's the impression that I got, that if this is a work in progress and that the balance, that, that very important balance, hasn't been reached yet. Uh, there are many people in our community uh, that can't use the technology and they feel very frightened and shut out and I'm sure you, are, you, you come over, you know that is happening. Um, I just, there is an urgent need to get this balance and uh, is there a, a, a will there to, to get this right, do you feel, amongst your colleagues? Thank you. We've got to get it right. The, you know, there's been, you know, horrendous press against general practice, against GPs, you know, in the last few weeks um, that, you know, many of us have, you know, had great difficulty with. So, so we know that, you know, a, a lot of people are dissatisfied uh, with what's going on and but but some of it you know has been foisted upon us and we've got to be careful though that um, people don't end up with getting a service that's going to be far worse than what they've got now so if you turn around to me and say that you want everything to be face to face I'll say that's fine but I will have a waiting list that is a week long within two weeks because I will not be able to get through what's coming at me at the moment and I would worry that we'll end up with more patients having to go to A&E because they can't wait you know, weeks to, to see a GP. So we've, we've, we've got to get the balance right, but we've got to get an understanding, I think, from people as well as to, you know, what it is we're trying to do, what is it that people want, you know, from us. Um, and I come back to what I said earlier on, sometimes things could be dealt with by someone else, not necessarily the GP. And so we've, I think, got to work with people to try and work out, you know, when is it appropriate, you know, to see a GP? And when would it be reasonable to see a nurse or to see a pharmacist? So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but um, I just think we've got to be careful when, when we try and look to see how is, this, how is the overall service, you know, going to end up? Because I don't think we've got... We haven't got the medical workforce to enable everyone to see a GP when they want to tomorrow. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Barnes. Um, 
My question is this. Um, I feel that uh, retaining existing GPs is probably one of the most important things that we could do. And I was wondering, is it just pure overwork? Or is if you had a magic wand, is there anything you could do to um, make the system better and retain GPs? I think that, first of all, there are a lot of my colleagues who are just burnt out. And that's, you know, part of the problem. Um, I think that one has to look at what's being expected of people at the moment. So we're coming into the autumn. If I tell you that my workload and what I'm dealing with feels like it's January, not the end of September. That makes me worry about how I'm going to cope moving into the winter and um, into early spring. That not only are we dealing with people who are or believe themselves to be unwell, but we've got a flu vaccination program that we're being expected to deliver. We've got the COVID booster program to deliver. So when, when people are looking at what's ahead of them, some of them say they can't, they can't do a full-time job the way they used to. And, you know, speaking for myself, I'll be honest, when I've done a full day in surgery, if you pardon my language, I'm knackered. I don't, have a, I don't have very much thinking capacity. And yet the patient who sees me at 8.30 in the morning would expect exactly the same from me if they saw me at 6.30 at night, and quite rightly so. So we do have to, you know, to, to look at what we're expecting, you know, from the medical workforce. So I think that we've got to find ways of um, allowing GPs to, to work more part-time because I think that's the way we will we'll cope with what the demands that are there. The BMA recently estimated that overall the NHS needs 50,000 more doctors we're not going to knit 50,000 more doctors overnight. You know, if it takes 10 years to, to train someone, in effect, to, to be a reasonably freestanding GP, um, you can see we've got a long way to go before we get there. So I, th I think, you know, there are, there, there are problems. You know, and people are looking at ways of um, trying to encourage GPs to spend a certain amount of time seeing patients, but maybe spend some time uh, mentoring colleagues or you know, having some uh, sort of leadership roles within the service so that they don't get themselves burnt out. And I suspect that's the way um, we retain some GPs. Um, the other, I suppose the other final problem is, and it's, and I'll be honest, it's, it's, it's not, it isn't money related because GPs are well paid. But it is about trying to get, you know, a, a work-life balance, you know, right. And, and I think at the, at the moment, a lot haven't got that right. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Thank you. Is there any more questions before? Oh, sorry, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> yeah, I'm concerned about. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm concerned about some of the um, treatments that used to be available at your GP uh, not so long ago. Uh, seem to be disappearing now. Um, the, the the first one that springs to mind was the issues that we had with phlebotomy. Whereas um, at one time you could go and see your GP, have your blood taken for tests, um, 
and then that, that, that ceased to happen. We went to a flea botany service, which is now mobile, I believe, um, which is okay, but it was something that, that stopped happening in the GP surgery. And the one that springs to mind now is um, to do with ear syringing. Now, I wear hearing aids, and whenever I go for uh, an appointment to the uh, audio department, I'm asked to have my ears checked and if they need syringing to have it done. And the GP used to do that at one time. Then it was passed to the practice nurse, and now I'm told that the practice nurses don't do that anymore. And I'm being told that people are having to pay £40 or so to have their ears syringed. So has that service disappeared, or is it still available within um, GP service? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I can't comment directly on uh, sort of commissioning decisions that, are, that have been made in the Wirral. However, um, at the end of the day, GPs, you know, provide a service according to the, to the contract that or the services commissioned from them. And if the clinical commissioning group has decided that it's not going to pay GPs for that service and it wants it done some other way, then that's exactly the way that that service is being you know, provided. Um, and I know that in, in very many uh, areas, the, the CCG has decided that it's um, more cost effective to have a, a smaller number of people uh, taking blood from a smaller number of sites than to have every GP practice you know, commissioned to, to provide that. And unfortunately, um, the same you know, goes with ear syringing. And certainly, you know, as a GP, I used to syringe ears, and that was eventually sort of delegated down to my nurse, partly because it, it was more cost effective for the nurse to do it. And now that's being provided, you know, by a more central service because it's felt that my nurse is, um, is more cost effective if, if they're doing, you know, a certain other work. So it, it does really depend on um, commissioning decisions that are made locally. Thank you. Just to get also, sorry for, to make uh, Councillor Berry, one of the things that the Partnerships Committee is doing is the CCG is coming here with the commissioning um, and also with the low clinical, um, low clinical um, commissioning as well. So that forms part of the ear syringe. So that is on the agenda item for one of the Partnerships Committee. Is that okay? So that might answer some of those questions there as well. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions for um, Dr. Um, Barnes? No. Can I just again thank you on behalf of all the committee and all the hard work that you do. It really is appreciated on everybody else, that obviously within general practice. And again, very, very informative and um, interesting. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Barnes. Thank you. Okay, so thank you all very much and thank you for your questions. And I hope that I managed to answer them for you. Thank you. Sorry, could I formally uh, move the recommendation, please, for agenda item six? Could I have a seconder, please? Um, uh, Councillor Johnson, thank you. Uh, thank you. If we could now move to um, agenda item seven, please, integrated care system. Uh, could I also in invite uh, the Director of uh, Care and Health to introduce the report and also speak to please, Graham? And thank you. Also, Graham, for stepping in as well for the agenda item. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report on um, integrated care system and integrated care partnerships um, is intended to be informative uh, in relation to progress of the Health and Care Bill, uh, specifically, uh, and to focus really on the development of integrated care systems and integrated care partnerships within that. It builds upon presentation and discussion um, that took place recently um, at an all members workshop. 
Um, in terms of background, uh, it should be noted that the Health and Care Bill is at committee stage at this point in time. So what that means is it's undertaking line by line examination so that um, there is a, a, a rider that goes with everything I say today, which is that's the information that we have so far. Uh, but obviously the bill is in process and, uh, you know, is not final at this, at this stage. Um, the primary aims, really, of, of, the key, of the bill and the changes are to um, enable greater collaboration across the NHS, um, in essence, to see the NHS working together as one um, and changing much of the competition um, rules that sit around the NHS. Um, there's also uh, an element that is about improving accountability. Um, I think that can be read in a number of ways because clearly in terms of accountability, the accountable organisations would be at Cheshire and Mersey level for us or at those sort of integrated care system levels as opposed to at the moment it uh, sits with um, CCGs. But really the key feature uh, of interest is the focus, I think, on place-based partnership and provider collaborations to foster that uh, collaborative working across the NHS, both in local places, but also across similar organisations that deliver sim similar types of services. Um, this paper does set out some of the key terms and a number of the terms have changed over time, but the key elements to that are the integrated care system, uh, which is about the um, area, in our case Cheshire and Merseyside, and how that comes together. And within that care system, integrated care board, and the integrated care board is in essence the NHS leadership board, and integrated care partnership, which brings together a much broader fo focused partnership, um, focusing primarily on health inequalities and uh, bringing um, representatives from nine local authorities into that um, discussion. And of course, below that, place-based partnership. And for us, place means we're all. Um, so the role of integrated commissioners, uh, to a degree, is covered in, in the report. And uh, the, the idea really is that it does build upon um, partnership that we've uh, been successful uh, in recent years with the CCG. And um, there's been a clear focus and would continue to be a clear focus on improving population health outcomes as part of that approach. It's also important to note that within this paper there's a timetable for reform uh, that's set out in 3.23 uh, and then later in 3.29 um, the specific timetable in relation to the um, the Integrated Care Board and the Integrated Care Partnership is set out as well. So there's two slightly separate timetables there. But what you can see at a glance is that there's a huge amount to happen between now and April um, of next year. Uh, and of course, it's likely that April of next year is simply the structural start of the reforms as opposed to the reforms being um, delivered in full. I hope that's helpful as an introduction to the paper. Thank you again, Graeme. Do I have any questions, please, from members for uh, uh, councillor? Sorry, thank, Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's Integrated Care Board 3.9. Integrated Care Boards will be a statutory organisation that brings the NHS together locally to improve population health and establish a shared strategy. The two CCGs and the Close, close proximity to two uh, doctors' practices in my ward. They seem to be at war all the time in the way they want to move things forward. Who's going to make the decision at the end of which GP's practice is doing the right thing? So the, the um, organisation of GPs at the moment is through primary care networks. They are groups of uh, GPs that work well together loosely based on geographical location. Um, in some areas, they were able to go for full geographical location. 
in uh, Wirral, but uh, it's slightly different than, than geographical location. There are some primary care networks that, that cut across. Um, so, so they're pretty well established now, and a lot of resources go direct down, directly down to those um, practices. Also, in terms of the, um, the GP contract, the core contract, etc., then my understanding is that will um, come almost directly from the uh, Cheshire Emerging level through into um, GP services. Um, at the moment, that relationship is with NHS England directly, um, and my understanding is that that will um, through the primary, um, sorry, through the um, the board, the ICB to GPs. So, in essence, the the decision making around how GPs organise themselves will still be very much with GPs. Can I just come back on that because it's the, according to it, it's, it's all base, lower bases, down to the base with GPs who are actually going to organise the CCGs which are disappearing, so we're going to have one CCG, which we know and we've heard from our uh, colleague already that there's concerns and there's worries by GPs of what's going to happen within the next, what is it, six, seven months that we've got to deal with, that these are going to be we're going to have issues foist upon us by people we don't even know is going to be on any issues yet. And this is the problem that the majority of my constituents see and talk to me about. What's going to happen in the future? Who's going to be responsible? We know who's going to be responsible. It's the Secretary of State for Health. And they will be the ones that are making all the major decisions. We've already heard from our colleagues across the table that uh, certain medical procedures are slowly disappearing from GC's, GP's practices. Like your good self, I wear two hearing aids and another problem that you're going through. It's something that was done, and quite rightly, one of our nurses was brilliant at doing it, the other one wasn't so good, but uh, again, that's disappeared. Um, the bloods, they changed, they went back, they're back with now with my GPs, so I get them done on my, my uh, with my GP sense of practice. But there are other things, you know, chiropody and all sorts of things, which are, seems to be minor down the lower scale, but affect an awful lot of people, you know, which need to be addressed. And these are the things that really worried. But who's gonna make the decision at the end? It's gonna be one CCG, huh? where's it gonna be based? Somewhere out in Cheshire, you know, looking after the people in Whittle. Who's gonna make the decision? that's going to spend the money in the right order for our, our constituents. Thank you. I mean, it is true that the, uh, the bill in its current form does um, give the Secretary of State additional powers, and it is also true that a number of decisions will be made um, by the ICB at Cheshire and Merseyside level. It's also equally true that uh, a number of services will be um, led locally and that our um, providers will have a key role within that as provider collaborative but also that um, the council and the ICB at place which is in essence the residue of the CCG the people that used to work for the CCG will predominantly work here in Wirral as commissioners in Wirral and uh, what, what will um, we propose at the moment, and I can only say propose now because obviously, you know, this thing isn't fully um, developed at this stage, is that um, primary care services, um, community services, all of those um, resources around social care and joint services continue to be commissioned and delivered locally. And that certainly has the support of the Cheshire and Merseyside ICS at this stage. Um, so I, I, I don't think it's right to, um, um, for people to be too fearful about those changes. We've also received um, clarity that the budgetary situation from the 1st of April 2022 will be a steady state situation, certainly for the first year. So between 2022 and 2023, um, the budget is not uh, as we're currently being told 
uh, going to suddenly change. Um, now, that's helpful to us because um, in Wirral we have a high investment in pooled funds and uh, those pooled funds which enable local elected members and others to have a say about how those health care services delivered locally will continue. Thank you, uh, Graham. Could I ask a question what you've said there? Because obviously the saying about the budget 2022-23 uh, is not going to change, which I know some years everyone's waiting for these budgets to come in, aren't they, obviously at the end of the year, and obviously it's hard to plan. However, whilst that might seem a positive in some ways, also we've got long COVID now, we've got obviously additional burdens to your system, so actually the budget saying the same might not be a positive, uh, because, you know, obviously there's been some additional funding coming from COVID, the COVID fund. But you're going to have additional pressures, aren't you? You've got a backlog, and um, I would imagine social care, which is for a lot of the documents sadly don't really mention social care enough. I feel uh, because it is a big, it is an integration as they call it, isn't it? But it's, it's a lot about the NHS. We were important, but social care really isn't mentioned a lot in, in a lot of the documents, are they? Very much so. That's a concern that obviously, and they are the most vulnerable in society as well, aren't they? People obviously requiring care package, etc. On this document, well, if you don't mind. The timetable obviously has lapsed in as much those things unfortunately haven't come to fruition yet obviously because of you know different things national and different things so of these different boards icb ics icc whatever they want to be i'm assuming you would be involved in most of these as well as the day job um obviously which takes up a lot of your time as a director with obviously all that so and also i would like to ask primary care networks obviously um Dr. Barnett mentioned, where do they sit at place? Because again, with the, with the um, patients feeding in obviously to the practices and then obviously the GPs themselves, where do they, where would they sit in Whittle at place? Um, obviously on those, if you don't mind, thank you. There was a lot in that, Chair. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> a great deal in that. Um, yeah, okay. So, um, f first of all, I mean, I think that, yes, on, on the one hand, it's good to be told that the um, budget situation would be steady state and that there would be no um, immediate changes. But that's in the scenario where COVID expenditure is very, very high uh, across Cheshire and Merseyside. And my understanding is that there's a, around £800 million worth of expenditure related to COVID in addition to the previous costs of the system. And clearly, uh, a whole range of organisations, including local authorities, are still bearing um, the, the, the COVID costs and the COVID responses. And, and I know, for example, mental health services have been under significant pressures, acute services uh, under significant pressure, and uh, as are um, pr primary care services. Um, in addition to all of that, social care is under huge pressure, uh, particularly in relation to domiciliary care services and the, uh, the availability of domiciliary care across the borough and that's all now at the start of winter so um, I, I do agree that steady state is not the answer to all of our questions I think I think really um, the announcement in relation to steady state is to try and not engender panic in, in relation to what could happen on, on the 1st of April if it wasn't clear what would happen around budget so it's to, to really try and uh, enable people to uh, that they're involved in the system to be um, not overly concerned about that, but I completely understand what you're saying, Chair, that there are new things coming and we've yet to understand what the impact of long COVID is likely to be or any other significant variants of COVID that may come along in, in the coming months. Um, in terms of the legislation and social care, then, um, uh, well, I would agree, Chair, that, um, that there's not a lot of mention uh, in relation to social care. Um, the government has recently uh, published uh, a new paper on social care and uh, that um, really uh, significantly focuses on uh, how people pay for care and um, the um, changes to lifetime allowances around expenditure on care and the use of national insurance to uh, enable that to be, to be covered in terms of cost. That in itself is a huge change for care, but it doesn't, it's not clear exactly how that will work as we go forwards. Uh, and uh, the anticipation is that there'll be significantly increased demand um, uh, as a result of the legislation. And that's because clearly, um, you know, people will 
want to rightly save their properties and ensure that they don't have to cash those in to pay for social care bills uh, over their lifetime. So big changes coming in relation to that. What we're not clear about is how the funding will pass through the systems and how, how they will um, enable social care to be, on the one hand, integrated alongside healthcare, uh, as it is at the moment, but also enable to um, respond to the levels of need that um, sit under the statutory responsibility of the local authority. So um, I think there's a lot to be worked through there in terms of the detail, both in relation to ICS and I, uh, ICB, but also in relation to the um, um, legislation from government, which uh, is at a very early stage. It's green paper at this stage. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of consultation and development to be done around that. In terms of the uh, timetable for reform, then um, I, I would concur, Chair, there's, there, there's certainly slippage within that. Um, the bit I don't think that can slip is the dissolution of the CCGs on the 1st of April or 31st of March. So I think there are some givens in here. But guidance is late, um, things like um, uh, recruitment timetables and HR um, announcements are, are all quite late and, and as has been some of the guidance. Um, it's kind of inevitable with this timetable that some of it will slip. Um, and the volume of information that is coming out is still incredibly high in terms of guidance and, and other details. What I can say is that um, we, um, when I say we, I, I mean um, myself as a chief officer, other officers uh, locally from the council and from the CCG, have had a lot of involvement with Cheshire and Merseyside in terms of discussing the potential reforms and, and how uh, they uh, could be uh, effectively dealt with in the borough. So uh, we have had a lot of engagement involvement in there and, and in um, responding to, uh, I suppose, the challenge of uh, being a system that would be able to take a lot of delegated responsibility um, from the ICB into place. Finally, primary care networks. Pr primary care networks really um, ought to form the absolute core of what happens at place. Neighbourhood and, and uh, local level work um, is critical and um, the primary care networks were developed really to um, serve populations of around 30,000 people and to be able to understand their needs and prioritise how services go to them. Now, Locally, there's been some really good pro, uh, progress, particularly with the voluntary community and faith sector um, and primary care networks, working with people who uh, uh, need low-level inputs, but low-level inputs to enable them not to access primary care as much. And, you know, some good examples locally of um, fluid intake and voluntary sector people um, supporting people with just, you know, measured glasses to you know ensure that they get the right amount of fluids every day and those types of things mm -hmm. so we've seen a lot of that um, over the longer term the idea would be that all of our health and care services are much better joined up at that um, local neighborhood level working absolutely hand in glove with primary care networks that's the bit that we can improve significantly how we work much better locally with primary care so I think that's, that's the challenge, and that's uh, very much a core part of this. But I think it's something that is a, a real opportunity going forward. Can I just sorry, ask, Graham, sorry, um, Dave, so the primary care network, where do they sit a place? Do they sit on our health and wellbeing board? Do they sit where within all this structure, the ICB? Sorry. Okay, right. So the structure is um, in development and uh, there's due to be a governance workshop on the 8th of October and at that governance workshop taking the views of elected members from our um, joint workshop that we had uh, one of the elements is to understand what that governance looks like now um, the the idea is that a place board is a is a place board that includes participation from a, 
a very broad group of members. So um, not just the health providers, the local authority and the um, representatives of the ICB at place, also um, uh, primary care, um, in some independent sector people, and when I say independent sector people, I mean independent sector providers locally, voluntary community and faith sector, health watch, and others. So a really broad membership in that place board. And the idea is that that place board would be the key place for making decisions around the, um, the, the local system. That would sit under the health and wellbeing board, so the Health and Wellbeing Board is the prime system place that has overview of outcomes for the population, um, has responsibility for publishing a health and wellbeing strategy annually and a joint strategic needs assessment annually. And then the idea is that all of the place plans then um, feed into, uh, uh, into that and, and develop from the health and wellbeing strategy. Um, so that's to be considered, that's to be worked through in terms of exactly how that would uh, be uh, put together. And it would form a proposal to the um, Cheshire and Mersey ICS at this stage, or the ICB going forward, in terms of saying, um, from our workshop, this is how we think we could have the governance at borough level. In addition to what I've just described, there also needs to be a formal decision-making place, which would be a, a joint committee between the local authority and the ICB at place to make decisions around pooled funds. Uh, and that would have to be uh, an arrangement that enables the local authority to have a, uh, a vote because it's both local authority resources and NHS resources that we're talking about in pooled funds. So I hope that's helpful in terms of the, the, the where we're trying to go with this. But clearly, that's um, my attempt to describe something which is not yet in a formal document anywhere and needs to be further developed. Okay. Uh, thank you, Graeme. Um, Councillor Hayes and then Councillor Brand and then Councillor Jordan, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Graeme. Um, first, a little minor pedantic point. There's a slight typo on page 21. Um, regards, I think it's August, should be August 2021, it says August 2012, so that's a small pedantic issue, but what my question is this, is on the 1st of April 2022, you, you say it's sort of set in stone that these things are going to happen and the Health and Care Act going to come into force, now you also say that there is some slippage, I mean are you fully confident come hell or high water that on that date we will have a health system at least as good as what we've got now? with all things considered. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm confident that the CCGs will be dissolved on the 31st of March. Um, I, I, I don't think structural change, and the NHS, you know, the NHS goes through structural change on a, on a very regular basis. Those structural changes don't often impact directly upon the services that are delivered, certainly not immediately. Um, but there are a number of concerns which I'm sure elected members will have and the public will have about um, that assurance. I'm not sure that I can give that assurance. I think it's something that would have to come from, um, uh, certainly from either Cheshire and Merseyside level or from government itself in terms of that assurance that the health service won't be negatively impacted in any way, shape or form. What I can say is we'll absolutely do our best locally to make sure that there is no such impact. Um, but, you know, given the context that we've just talked about in terms of a worldwide pandemic and, um, you know, winter coming up very rapidly, um, and, you know, in April we'll only just be getting over winter, I think it's a big ask. Really. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brennan, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, for your report, Graham. Um, uh, well, um, the last question sort of t touched on an observation that I was just going to make um, uh, about the government appear to have taken the public policy implementation handbook uh, and just ripped it up in terms of the timescales that they're operating to, because as we've heard earlier in the meeting, we've got less than six months to go. We still don't have a chair. 
in place. We still don't have a chief executive in place. You've just described arrangements uh, still yet to be defined, crucial parts of the, of the system. Um, and um, it just makes you wonder, doesn't it, uh, what's driving, what are the drivers for that? I'm not asking you to answer this question, incidentally. Well, what are the drivers um, uh, for the politicians that they need to act so hastily um, to get this system uh, in place by April next year when we're in the middle of a global pandemic? Anyway, but I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, leave that one there. Um, my, my question um, is, uh, actually, I, don't, I think it might be to the chair rather than to yourself. Um, I think at the last meeting, we uh, agreed that we would have a single item meeting on this topic uh, where we would hear a variety of informed voices and their views on the arrangements encompassing maybe doctors, academics, health unions, patients, to get that overall perspective uh, on the proposed uh, changes. Uh, I don't think, uh, although I may have missed it, that it's in, in the work plan, and maybe I should have raised this question in the work plan agenda item, but I just wondered where we were in making arrangements uh, for that session. Um, thank you, Councillor Brown. Th we do have a stand, well, there is the ICS. I know Graham was stood on the, uh, was given us more of a like local and a bit of the uh, background, or let's say the national information um due to obviously we'd set the agenda with the spokes and stuff and obviously uh, but some of the organizations like the ccg and the pcc we've already they couldn't make some of the dates so what we've done is we've had to move around some of the agenda items obviously um to fit so the ics is in its entirety is coming to a future meeting um however i think at the moment i'll have to ask dan is it sorry dan to put you on the spot is it february now we still have the option as a committee if it's obviously that's too late again some of these things aren't as we've just seen the timetable aren't haven't been adopted at the moment so if committee feels when we get to the work program they want that to be put on a separate agenda item right? that's still it that still is obviously something you can do but that is still the intention to do a fuller scrutiny this was sort of more about place and getting a bit more information prior to the full scrutiny really if that answers your question councillor brandon Uh, Councillor Cossier. Yeah. yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, just going back to the um, the implementation or the program, if you like, what's the, um, the the scrutiny milestones from central government over this, and is there any consequences if these milestones aren't met, and what would they be? So I'm, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I don't. I don't have that detail. Um, certainly, in terms of the um, in, in terms of the legislation, as I say, it's still passing through Parliament. Um, uh, once it's passed through, then then we'll have the the final version of, of the legislation. Um, in terms of local scrutiny, then I think that you know, once there's something concrete, then that that certainly can be scrutinised. And my understanding is that. Um, the scrutiny partnership would be across Cheshire and Merseyside level. So if we're looking at how local authorities scrutinise the, the arrangements, then um, there'd be something about well, what, you know, that sort of Cheshire and Merseyside joint scrutiny approach. But in terms of government scrutiny, then, then I don't know. I'd, I'd have to look into that for you. Okay. If I can just come as well back on that, Councillor Cossier. Um, unfortunately, I know Graham is going to look into it. The joint scrutiny committee, which covers all the nine areas, unfortunately hasn't met. Now, um, which is led, I believe, and I might be wrong, by Cheshire. Now, I know Dan, obviously, is it not led by Cheshire? Oh, well, we're supposed to obviously sit on that, obviously, the will, but unfortunately, it hasn't met. I've not had any further information. Dan has chased that. I know Graham was going to look into it, but that part of the scrutiny, of a, which would be the ICS, unfortunately, is not taking place, unfortunately, at the moment. Sorry, Vicky. Chair, if I can just say that a conversation has taken place between the monitoring officers of the various local authorities in Merseyside and Cheshire about uh, joint scrutiny. There is a, a protocol um, for joint scrutiny across Merseyside and Cheshire. Um, 
and under the protocol, um, obviously it, it depends on what the um, issue is that's being scrutinised and which local authorities were, were, are involved, because when the protocol was written, um, it obviously wasn't necessarily written with, with, with the ICS in mind, so um, it was envisaged that any issue that was scrutinised may only affect one or two or three of the local authorities across Merseyside and Cheshire. Um, and so under the protocol, it's really for the local authorities to agree between themselves who takes the lead. So for example, when the issue came up about the, um, the urgent care um, issues that were affecting the walk-in centre at Eastham, um, obviously that to some extent affected Cheshire West as well because people came across the border um, and so we did joint scrutiny with Cheshire West but we all took responsibility for organising the joint committee because obviously it was primarily our area that was affected so as I say discussions have started um, amongst the monitoring officers as to um, when we invoke that protocol, which local authority sort of takes the lead for setting up the committee, and when is the appropriate time to um, put that arrangement in place, because as we keep saying, the legislation is still passing through Parliament at the moment, um, so we're obviously keeping an eye on that, and, and further discussions are, are due to take place, and so we can, we can come back to you in relation to that. But, but we are aware of those issues, and we are having those conversations with colleagues across Merseyside in Cheshire. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Vicky, I'm, can I come back on a question? Um, so the nine areas have done red lines, haven't they, the red lines document? Yes. So all nine health and wellbeing boards have come out with this good red line, so would that not be something that would, they would jointly also scrutinise those that they're being looked at and sort of the, the impacts on those? Or would that not come under the protocol? Would that come to something else? Well, as I say, I think, I think at the moment, Chair, what we need to consider first and foremost is whether actually the, the current protocol is fit for this purpose or whether we actually need to even review the protocol um, or, as I say, or, or whether it, we, we can use it in its present format to deal with um, this particular um, issue. Um, so, as I say, that those, those on go, discussions are ongoing um, between, the, uh, between the monitoring officers um, and I think we can probably come back to you with some, some proposals um, fairly soon as to how we suggest um, that, that that issue of joint scrutiny is, is dealt with um, across the whole of Merseyside and Cheshire. Okay, thank you. Is there any other questions at all for Graham? Oh, Councillor Mitchell and then Councillor Jordan. Oh, sorry, I do apologise. Councillor Jordan was next and then Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Graham. Um, Graham, one of the key aims of the ICS is to reduce health inequalities. And we know the CCG commission services, and equally so, they can decommission them, as we've heard tonight with uh, ear syringing. So what happens with the ICS, where we're commissioning at place, if the commissioning intentions remain the same across nine places, does that mean to say we're going to have a postcode lottery across Cheshire and Merseyside? Because we've already seen services moved from Wirral. We've lost vascular services to Chester. We've lost trauma and rehab to Liverpool. Our inpatient cancer services have moved to Liverpool. Spinal services are now centred in, in Walton. It just strikes me the model's becoming more and more Liverpool-centric and Wirral residents are missing out. They're going to have to travel longer distances to get treatment. Thank you, Councillor Jordan. Um, so at Cheshire Merseyside level, those more specialist services would be the services that are commissioned at that sort of level. So I think that decisions around very specialist services, around um, acute mental health services, for example, um, and those types of things would, would be made through the um, ICB at Cheshire and Mersey level. So um, there would be less influence from a, a local level on those types of things. Um, Certainly at the place level, then we're looking at those um, uh, much more localised services such as community services and primary care and how they work together. Um, and obviously things like low level interventions, which is, is kind of where the ear syringing comes in. But certainly for those more complex specialist services, those decisions will be 
a, a further step away, I, I understand, as opposed to being um, with CCGs. Thanks, Graham. Can I just come back on that? My, my sort of query was really about, well, both specialist and about, and about the um, those at place. If the um, place-based commissioning stays the same as it is at the moment, then we're still going to have a postcode lottery across Cheshire and Merseyside in exactly the same way as we've got now. Um, if the question is, will it be different in different places, then it is likely to be different in different places in terms of the way the offer is constructed. And I would go further and say that um, when, when you um, look at primary care networks and work at neighbourhood level, then it is likely that um, services will be focused in, in the areas of the highest levels of need. So there, there is something about, there is a, um, a, a, an interface between having everything the same and shared out thinly across the whole of Cheshire and Merseyside, or do we have a scenario where um, local people, elected members and services make decisions about where to focus their resources in the local place in Wirral. So I, I believe there will be some difference um, from um, across the nine local places, there will be some differences, I, I'm sure. Um, having said that, within each place there will be an officer accountable uh, to the ICB. Um, and one of those accountabilities is dealing with difference and dealing with um, standards of delivery across national standards. So national standards will be maintained and there are some absolute givens within those. So, you know, yes, there will be some local variation, but national standards will still have to be maintained. So, um, you know, the, the kind of level of variation that I suspect you may be concerned about should be minimised. Would you mind if I just come back on that before you come in, Councillor Mitchell? Uh, sorry, Graham. So, uh, uh, pre-COVID, the CCG on Wirral had a, a large deficit. And going into the ICS, it says in the white paper, doesn't it, that obviously they're not allowed to ta carry any deficit, and I believe so, unless it's changed, because things do change by the day, that are not allowed to, any of the nine areas that's used, obviously, Wirral allowed to take any deficit in. Now, as far as I knew last time I looked at the pool funds, there wasn't any deficit because the agreement under the, those pool funds, if there was, had to be shared. So I'm not too sure about that now because I know there's been some COVID recovery fund hasn't it to go in. So do they then also have to go on the NHS race as well? Because that's coming, hasn't it? There has to be a race now. And then the other thing is, sorry to put on you, you mentioned an officer will be accountable to or will answer to or will feed into the ICB or the ICS board. However, in the white paper, whoever that person may be, it's a bit like being on a, on a, on a board of a company. They, it doesn't matter if they work for a local authority, they're a councillor, it doesn't matter what their is in and then say, let's use Wirral. They have to go with the ICS's decision, and that is written in, not quite in those words. They're obviously in within the white paper as well, so that still stands as well, doesn't it? In terms of the place lead, then the, uh, as I understand it, the, the clarity around that job description, uh, the detail of the terms of reference and all of those things are, are yet to come out of the NHS. Um, but the idea is that those place leads would be a joint appointment between uh, local authorities and the ICB, but you're quite um, correct to, to point out, Chair, that there would be accountability into the ICB uh, for the NHS spend and the NHS uh, resources, also delivery of NHS outcomes, standards, and all of those sorts of things. So that so that would actually that would absolutely be part of that that place leader role, uh, as well as if it's a joint appointment, um, accountability into the local authority for use of local authority resources, outcomes for uh, population health, uh, and into residents. Sorry, Councillor Mitchell. That's fine, Chair, because you asked half of my question. <laughs> the, the other point is I wanted to mention was in relation to uh, the information of uh, scrutiny. I, I was under the impression we had a paper on this at the beginning of uh, this, this term of office 
in relation to the makeup of those boards? Has that now been scrapped? But the second part is mentioned about not being able to carry any deficits over, guaranteed the funding for one year. What happens after the end of that next year? Will those deficits then fall on us and the, the local NHS to be cleared? I can only really talk about the pooled fund resources. I think it would be very difficult for me to talk about national resources and Cheshire and Merseyside level decision making. But in terms of the pooled fund resources, there isn't a deficit. It, uh, it's a balanced pool um, at this time. And um, it's um, because of the nature of what we commission, it's um, services that uh, are delivered on block. So, for example, there's a community equipment service and it's delivered for a certain number of uh, items of equipment, deliveries and all of those sorts of things. So most of those services that are jointly commissioned in the pooled fund uh, have, a, have a ring fence around them so that the risk is limited. The one area where there is risk uh, is around um, people with learning disabilities and complex autistic spectrum disorders and, and those types of conditions where um, both as a local authority and as a CCG um, we have um, quite a high level of risk around the cost of those packages. Uh, bringing it together has enabled us to um, to work effectively uh, to, to support people rather than arguing about who pays for the package. But that is the one area where uh, there has historically been um, significant risk. Uh, there isn't in this financial year, but there has historically been significant risk in that area and, and there may be in the future as well. Chair, I may just come back on another point and it's scrutinising individual areas and where they're looked after. We've had presentations here to this committee where major orthopaedics have gone over to Liverpool, as Mary says. Hearts have gone over there. Lungs have gone over there. If they ever have a debate about Clatterbridge Cancer Centre, which one are they going to choose? The original one here or the one in Aintree? Yeah, sorry, is it Cancer Is this to me or is this sort of... Is a, that is was a general question because we're talking about scrutiny and where, where we're going forward. I was saying that the comments were made they will be delegated to the areas where the particular issues fall or lie initially. Now we had the cancer centre, Clatterbridge Cancer Centre. We've always had it because it's in Clatterbridge, Mary's Ward. We now have a Clatterbridge Centre in Aintree. If it's going to be scrutinised, who scrutinise it? Us or them? That was a question. Well, I would say that's why I've been pushing with the joint scrutiny committees. That's the nine areas, things like that, from this committee. And I'm sure they've all got committees of some sort, going to depend on their sort of governance arrangements that need to feed in before. I think Graham said before that the critical part, which I agree, is obviously general practice, the patients. If they come last, it's already been decided, hasn't it? They need to, some things need to come first before those things are put into place, not last. But I think part of that would be in this joint scrutiny, which I know Vicky's just said is being worked on, um, because that's a good question, but we don't have the answers to them because those discussions haven't taken place. And there's so much to do, isn't there, in a short period of time. And that goes back to my first question, is I thought we had a paper to this committee with a breakup of the way things were working and it would have worked out that there'd be three members from this council that were on that one initially on that scrutiny committee. Chair, I can answer that for uh, Councillor Mitchell. Yes, Councillor Mitchell, there, there was a report brought to this committee in order for this committee to decide which members it wanted to appoint. If the, if the joint scrutiny committee was formed um, in accordance with the protocol. So the, the, the joint scrutiny committee isn't a standing committee. Um, as I say, there is a protocol which enables a joint committee to be formed um, or called together to meet. Um, that hasn't been um, formally um, invoked yet or, or, or brought together. And as I say, that's what we are looking into. Um, normally, the scrutiny committee would um, consider proposals that were being put forward in relation to changes in services uh, that were being um, implemented by the health service. So, for example, as you say, uh, um, there may be a change to a service 
um, which is, is based in one locality, but if that affects other localities and other areas as well, if, if the, the service um, covers a number of areas, then obviously a number of local authorities may need to be involved in, in that joint scrutiny exercise. Um, as I say, when we had a joint scrutiny committee last, although the, um, the building, the, the walk-in centre was within the area of Wirral, it did have an impact on residents of Cheshire West and therefore we did joint scrutiny together, both local authorities. So um, I hope that helps. Sorry, if I could just come back and ask a question. Sorry, Graham. The pool fund, as you mentioned about children, which is, is, is a, as you said, is a, and it is obviously quite, you know, a, a massive area and a great need, obviously, and something we're all interested in, making sure it's protected. Um, I'm not sure, obviously, but I know some of the children's services are not going to be at place, are they? They're going to be taken into what I call the, the main ICS board. I know mental health services, it's, well, it's, it's been mooted or in some papers. Again, that may have changed over nice. But, so, do you know what, what services will stay? Because obviously within that pool fund there's obviously quite a large proportion for children's services, as you say, and there's EHDB plans, isn't there? Different services within that, are they going to stay, do you know, at place yet, or is that not the case? So, I, actually, we've got a relatively small element of our pool resources that relate to children's services. We, we have uh, children with disabilities funding in, in there, um, but it's a, it's a very small part of the pool. Um, in terms of the uh, local authority commission children's services, then obviously they, they, they stay with the local authority. But in terms of um, specialist services commission for children, then um, I, I'm not clear. I'm not sure exactly what will be commissioned at place and what will be commissioned at Cheshire and Mersey level. Okay. Possibly that's something we obviously make from the CCG come and make obviously ask those questions there. So it's been a good some discussions here will come to the CCG questions, won't we? Is there any more questions for Graham for any members at all, please? No? Well, thank you very much, Graham. I said it's been interesting. Thank you for your time and the report. Um, could I ask um, the committee then, please, to move the recommendation, please? Um, could I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Councillor Cossier, can I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Barry. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Graham. Um, if I could now move, please, to item 8 on the agenda, the work programme, um, pages 31 to 36. And could I pass over, please, to Vicky Shaw for this report, please. Thank you, Chair. Members, the purpose of this report is to ensure that you have the opportunity to contribute to the delivery of the committee's work programme. Um, as you will see from the report before you, there is um, already a fair number of um, items on your work programme, um, but uh, I would welcome members' comments and um, if there's any issues that you would like to add to the work programme. Um, we would be pleased to, to hear your comments and views. Is there any questions? Uh, Councillor Brennan? Just to very briefly go back to the point I made on the last item, um, I'd like the work programme to reflect the decision that we took at the last meeting, and uh, I would like that session to happen sooner rather than later, if that's possible, please. A committee happy to do the uh, council brands are they happy to sort of make sure that's on the work program and it happens sooner rather than later uh, council brandon he mentioned the point earlier would like to sort of see the actual ics mentioned in the work program but also um he'd like that to sort of take place um sooner rather than later so is that all right is there any comments on that uh, council johnson yeah it's, it's sort of, it's in currently in february isn't it yep yeah. Yeah, I think uh, before Christmas, if, if at all possible. So what would that be to replace then? Would that be adding on to November and moving the police? Or it's just that you set in stone already those dates, haven't you, with those people who are going to be talking, the RNLI, the police and such like, I believe, haven't you? The only other suggestion would be that we, what the original one was a standalone item. Um, because as you say, we've gone through, obviously, um, It, it might be a standalone item because it's on with the actual um it is on with the can you just remind me please obviously if you don't mind down because we have changed this a few times just so we sort of get this correct for all committee members
so we've got the November, the PCC and the, and, um, the police, CCG commission and finance update. That, we had that as a standalone item because that's quite a big item itself. So the ICS was suggested for November, but then it's going to be the CCG commission so the two don't end up confusion as such because um, that's probably Wirral based. So the pool fund and the ICS is actually the 2nd of February and then the RNI, um, they're coming on the 2nd of February as well. So the only other thing would be put it on the 9th of November if the CC or well, the CG are attending um, or have a standalone item. I don't know what committee members feel. Councillor Brennan. Um, I'm, I'm slightly confused, but um, that's sometimes a state that, that my sort of permanent state, so apologies if I'm missing something obvious here. But I think we decided at the last meeting that we would have a single item meeting on this question, a standalone meeting on this question. And there is not a standalone meeting on this question in the work plan. So, so my question is, uh, w w w where is the standalone meeting on this question? Okay, what happened was obviously this is the, myself, the vice chair, and the spokes, we had the discussion with the committee services. The original, obviously, before the changes with the, with the different organisations came back and said they couldn't make the programme that we did up until next year. And to include everything on the, on the work programme. And then we had to wait for the RNI to come back because they, they were going to come in September, I believe. But they felt that their report wouldn't be ready. So they asked, they, could they be moved, the PCC? So what we did, we met. So this is how this, this, is, this suggested for this evening has come out in this way. So again, it was a suggestion with the pool fund, which is one of the things which I think Gray mentioned last meeting was due to be obviously reviewed and changed. So to do that obviously prior to February will probably be too soon. Um, so this is where the suggestions come for the timetable for tonight. And that's only from the last spokes and chairs discussion. So it was to come bring it to committee tonight and have a discussion on that. So the ICS was going to be a standalone, but the pool fund was added to it because, again, it would have been something that we wouldn't have got in in the end of this ministerial year, well, next year. And that was one of the things that the committee would like to also discuss. So we can have a standalone or obviously look at that. It's entirely up to what the committee to decide, really. Does that make a bit more sense, Councilman? Why we've come to where we have come, to be fair. It's not been that simple, to be fair, we've all... It's been a bit of a nightmare, really, isn't it? So, um, but that's how we came about changing things around. And back to myself is to say, would people would like in the November, or would committee like it to be an, um, an additional item and just have the pool fund in, in the February? Open to suggestions. Um, Chair, I, I do think that we've discussed this at Spokes and we've all, we've all taken that back to our individual groups and certainly we've discussed this and we agreed with the changed new format and, and agreements. So as it stands now, I think it, it reflects well our direction of travel because the councillors, we've all met together and discussed ICS. We've covered ICS again this evening um, and I think February is fine for, the, for ICS for the third time, to be, to be honest. Um, unless you want to move the CCG. But as you said, the PCC and police, that's, that's a big item in itself. And it's important that we look at um, items other than health, which I know we've talked about quite substantially as well. Thank you, Chair. Um, the, the, the CCG, uh, my suggestion is not to move the CCG because they couldn't make tonight. Um, they didn't have anyone. So to move the CCG, we'd end up back to square one. Um, so my suggestion wouldn't be to move the CCG because they could actually come back and what we also did was, well, should be fair, Dan did committee services, they went back to the organisation, so we didn't have to change again for them to confirm the dates that we'd obviously changed them around to. So both the PCC and the CCG have come back and confirmed those dates. Um, so there is another suggestion that we could review this at the next meeting, because then the, the next one is the CCG, so sort of, and we might have more information where the ICS is, because um, a standalone meeting would just be programmed in with committee service for obviously and then it could just be the pool fund in February. Yeah, again, but apologies if I'm missing. Uh, uh, so what the conversation that we're having is about where we slot this topic into the cycle of agreed meetings. Um, no, it's already slotted in, isn't it, in February? No, it's not November, slotted. Or, yes, exactly, November or February. Um, I, I had understood our decision to be that we would have a separate standalone meeting on this topic. 
Yeah, and the February meeting was, however, the spokes and the chair decided that obviously the pool fund would be something we hadn't looked in, which the committee wanted to do. There was nowhere else to put the pool fund. So the suggestion for conversation was to put that in. So the ACS is the standalone in February. However, the pool fund is another item on the agenda. So my concern is um, that um, I think what the committee um, wanted to hear was a variety of voices on this question. Uh, and that requires uh, sufficient time on the agenda to hear those voices. Uh, and if, if we look at slotting this agenda item in alongside others, which is where it stands at the moment, because we've got another item in for February, then we begin to crowd those voices out uh, of that discussion. And I think it's important that we hear those perspectives on this extremely significant change to the way in which the National Health Service is being organised. So my primary concern is that we have sufficient time on the agenda to be able to listen to those differing perspectives. And it's not clear to me, as it stands, that the work programme will accommodate that. I, I take on board what, what you're saying, as I say, um, just to sort of restate the actual the ICS is a standalone item on that meeting. However, we decided to bring the pool because we'd have nowhere to put the, the pool fund in. I take on board what you're saying. For example, this evening, there was going to be some people that were invited as independent witnesses, which the committee agreed. Unfortunately, they couldn't make tonight either. So whilst I agree, um, obviously, I suppose, it, we'd have to have a standalone item before Christmas if the committee agreed, or we would give them notice that February would be the ICS, and then they'd have enough time and to be fair, we don't have timelines on... I know what you're saying, if you have too many items on the agenda, obviously it becomes... But the pool fund as well, or we could maybe move the pool fund to another, another one. It's, the suggestion is there, or to, if we could look at it from the next one with the CCG and then make a decision there, it's entirely up to committee. Chair, I, I think we, we as spokes have discussed this. We've talked about our groups. Um, yeah, we've talked about our groups and I don't think I'm happy of ha having another date on our agenda. This, is, this will be the third time discussing this item. And as we've talked about, we've got statutory obligations which we are trying to meet here, um, such as the flood risk we've got to talk about. And so, so there are elements here that we have to cover um, which have to fit into the agenda. So that's the challenge we've got. This cannot be an ICS committee. It, it, that's not what it is. Thank you. Uh, no, it's not an ICS committee. It's just on the, under the health factors, isn't it? Can I obviously, well, actually, can, uh, sorry. Vicky has just made a suggestion that we could do the pool fund as a workshop and then the ICS would be a standalone item, albeit that it would still be in February, unless the committee decides something urgent to put it forward before then. Would that be acceptable or... Sorry, Councillor Hayes. Yeah, I would, I would agree that's a good idea. So if we committee decide to obviously do the pool fund and take that off February and we'll do that as a workshop, would that be agreeable with you as well, Graham? Because I know that obviously some prior to some of us coming onto the committee, part of the pool fund was already done, wasn't it? Obviously, but not the other. The whole pool fund was looked at. That was the discussion. Would that be agreeable to all committee members that we put the pool fund as a workshop? Yep. And then are we all happy with that? Can I rec move that recommendation that we put the pool fund then to a workshop? Sorry, Councillor Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, no, I agree to that idea, but. We, we should ask, open it up to other members because there's other committees that will be interested in where that pool funding has been spent. Yes. But those committees won't scrutinise that those committees would do. It's not, it wouldn't be, I would well, presume well, our workshop would be around scrutiny. So children's services for one, people who are all the send children, we've heard what's going on and we don't know the answers for the future. So it'd be beneficial for them to know where the pool funding's going. Now it's going to be spent, along with all the... Sorry, okay. I'll let Graham answer the question. No, it's fine, Graham, if you... So, so if it helps, Chair, yeah, the, uh, the Better Care Fund elements of the pooled fund uh, come under the Health and Wellbeing Board, so they have a statutory duty to, to sign off the Better Care Fund elements. The budget as a whole um, goes to Adult Social Care and Public Health Committee for sign-off. Um, but there is a difference between the stewardship of the budget and the decisions being made around the budget which go to those committees and the scrutiny of the impact of that on the public and the public's views of, of how 
they've received those services, which, which is the scrutiny role. So there is a, there's a difference of role there. Uh, similarly, obviously, any decision about children's pooled funding would be children's committee. Thank you. Is that all right, Councillor Mitchell? Is everyone any other questions on that? Is everyone happy that I've moved the proposal and the work programme will make the pool fund into a workshop and leave the existing work programme as it is, which can be reviewed each meeting anyway? Do I have a, um, I'm happy to move that if we have a seconder. Uh, Councillor Hayes, thank you. I think that's obviously the end of the meeting, so I'd like to thank again Dr. Uh, Rob Barnes again for your attendance and for staying, and very much appreciated, and all committee members, um, officers as well, and also Graham for stepping in, and members of the public. So thank you very much, and uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you. Good night now. Good night.